You know, Christians are a funny lot, aren't they? Yes, you are. We are. We are funny. The Bible says we're a peculiar people. You know, our musicians did really well this morning, considering most of them were away. It's hard when you, most of the things you rely on are missing, isn't it? You know, it's hard to preach when the first two rows are totally empty. Because it makes me feel that you don't want to be close to me. So what we'll do... No, 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 no. I'm, I'm fed up with asking you to come forward. I'm going to move things and I'm going to come and stand down there. So Luke, Andrew, Joseph, come and move these first two rows here. What are you doing? Get back. No, no, you've had your chance. No, 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 no. No, I'm going to move. Yep. I'm going to come and be with you. Don't get upset. When Jesus came to church, he kicked the tables over. He didn't just move the chairs. There we go. That's messed up your religion, hasn't it? <laughs> no, I'll just put that by the side. I'll walk into it. Ooh, does that make you feel uncomfortable? <laughs> you know, Jesus wouldn't like sit on a platform when he taught people. He'd actually sit down and they'd sit round him. Not in rows, they'd actually sit around. The men, the women that segregate in the synagogue especially. Women on one side, men on another side. And sometimes we like the comfort of our systems and religious routines more than we actually like being, having God right in a space. You actually, actually, you know the Hebrew word for in God's presence, it's pene. It literally means having God right in front of your face. Pene means face. So God's presence means God's in your face. And English people don't like that, do they? Just, you get on the platform and do your religious stuff, and I'll hide in the congregation, and if I like it, I can accept it, and if I don't, I can ignore it. Hallelujah, are we okay? Good. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. We're going to look at our key text that we've been looking at now all year. We've been looking at this. What, what is it we're looking at? Does anyone know? Yeah. The Garden of God, well done. You see, once we get into a religious routine, you know what's happening. The minute you change things, that's when, it, that's when we all get, all get confused. Genesis 2, verse 8. I'm going to read down to verse 15. We're looking at the garden of God. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. God puts you somewhere. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've been looking at trees for the past few weeks of what they represent, different types of people and other things as well. Verse 10, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. Four rivers, but actually one river. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. 
it winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, or if you've got a King James Bible, it calls it the Hiddekel. It runs along the east side of Ashur, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Now, we've read this now a dozen times at least over these past few months, and we've seen how this is the first explanation that God gives to us about being in God's presence. God puts the man in the garden so that God can come and meet with him in the garden. So we've been looking at this now for months, how God puts you in a place. Did you know God's put you in a place? Do you know where he's put you? Do you know why he's put you there? Do you understand this? Or do you think everything's just haphazard? Just happens by coincidence. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't believe in fate. You believe in God's providence. You believe that everything works for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God puts you in his garden. Or at least he wants to. And we've been looking at lots of things. We've even looked at these rivers but once again, I just want us to look at these rivers. Now, we've just read the description there of the four rivers. Each of the four rivers has a name. Each of the four rivers has a location. Each of the four rivers are in places, geographic locations. This is not mythology. Just go back there to uh, verse 10. A river water in the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah. Havilah is a place. The Pishon is a river that flows through that place. It's a real place. We're going to look at it in a moment. Each one of these rivers is in a real place. A real geographic specific location that we can identify so we know where these rivers are the bible tells us so there's these four rivers they're in four locations they were all in the garden which gives us an idea of how big the garden was because these four rivers are in quite a large area and so when we look at these four rivers, we're looking at specific locations, we're looking at nations, we're looking at actually world empires, these rivers flowed through specific places. Better answer, it might be Gabriel. <laughs> well, that, turn that off quick. Usually when a, when a phone rings in church, it rings ten times before the person can find the button. If you remember what we looked at, what the river is, how the river is always a picture of the Holy Spirit, the river of God, all the way through the Bible. Remember at the end, in God's final garden, in Revelation, there is a river and Jesus says, let all who are thirsty, we sung it this morning, we mentioned it this morning, you are called to this river. There was a river that then became four rivers. Are you at that river? Do you know where that river is? Does that river flow? Are you at that river? Are you drinking at that river? Do you know what it means? What are these four rivers? I actually, um, I think I've put a, a PowerPoint, just a picture of where biblically these four rivers are mentioned. Now I say biblically because there's a lot of argument uh, amongst some people about where some of these rivers are and people argue about uh, the exact location of where these rivers are if you just stick to the bible and if you just stick to the bible names these are the only places that the rivers can sort of be now i accept that the Garden of Eden was before the flood of Noah, and there's been a lot of change since then, and tectonic plates have shifted. The earth itself has moved uh, in different places, and rivers themselves move, because as they cut through the earth, they change direction. So I accept that there's ambiguity of the exact specifics. But if you just stick to what the Bible says of the names of these rivers... Some people even say, although the names are the same, the, the rivers are different. But let's just stick with what the Bible says about where these rivers are. Because 
These rivers are mentioned in the Bible in other places. Okay, so if you go up to the top right-hand corner, to the top right-hand corner where you see Ashur, which is another name for Assyria, you will see a river there called the Tigris or the Hiddekel. Now that river is still there. Flows through Iraq, was the border of Iraq and then into Persia on the other side. So you can see where that river was. If you look next to it, you can see the Euphrates. No one really argues about these two rivers because they're still there. The Tigris and the Euphrates flow in what, is, what was ancient Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq through up into Syria, uh, into Turkey even in, in its original places. Okay, so you've got these two rivers there. Now, the other two, the Pishon and the Gihon, this is one people argue about. So if you come down to the far left, you will see there that you have the land of Havilah. The land of Havilah is what we would call today part of Egypt. Now, no one really debates that. That was the land of Havilah. There was gold there, etc. And so rabbis and ancient rabbis and people um, used the conjecture that that river was the Nile. Some people disagree and say it was a different river that no longer exists. But the land of Havilah was Egypt. And the Gihon is the strange one. Because there's only one Gihon mentioned in the Bible. After this river in Eden. And that's the river that runs under Jerusalem. The Gihon, the Gihon Spring. Now, again, people say, yeah, it can't mean that. It must have meant another river somewhere. Well, if it did, we don't know where it is. And if it did, we can't even talk about it. So God's given an example in, e in Eden, and we don't know what it is. Now, that might be the truth. But even if it wasn't the original river, it's got the same name. So God's still showing us the same principle. Are you following me? So these four rivers in Eden... Uh, more or less, those four rivers today, there will have been massive changes over thousands of years. We accept that. So if you look at where those four rivers are, somewhere, Eden was somewhere there incorporating those four rivers. Yeah? According to the Bible. Because those rivers flowed out of this place called the Garden of Eden, right? Don't limit it all to being like one tiny little square meter. No, it, the Garden of Eden could have been huge. We don't know how big it is. But somewhere there in what's called the, you know, the Mesopotamian Levant Fertile Crescent, what we tend to call the Near Middle East uh, today, that area. Now, you'll notice that the whole events of the Old Testament, the Bible generally, takes place in that bit. Yeah? The whole of the Bible story is in this bit. And the whole of the Bible story sort of revolves around these four rivers. It starts there, it ends there. So these four rivers are pretty important because this is where the nation of Israel, God's people, lived. And when I say lived, I mean at any point in their history where they were being obedient, disobedient, whether they were in captivity, whether they were in slavery, whether they were in freedom in their own nation, whatever life they were in, they were living by the side of one of those rivers. Whatever state of life you are in, whether you're living for God, whether you've been disobedient, whether you're not thinking things are going well, whether you think things are going well, whether you think you're in freedom, whether you think you're in slavery, whether you think you're oppressed, whether you think you're living in fear, you're still at the side of one of those rivers. Because the people of God always were. Because these are the rivers in the garden of God. And if you're a child of God, if you're a Christian, God puts you in his garden. Now, each one of those ri rivers and the nation that each one of those rivers was in is very different. Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, Israel. They are the four nations that those rivers ran through, still do run through. 
although we changed the, the nation's name. So Babylon now we would call Iraq. Now, when the children of Israel were camped by each one of those rivers, their lives were very different. When they were in Babylon, whether they were in Egypt, whether they were in Israel, whether they were in Assyria, had a very different impact on their life. Some of living in those nations sometimes was awful. Living by some of these rivers, their life couldn't be better. But I want us to focus on the river. Because Jesus says the river is the Holy Spirit. In the garden, in Egypt, in, in uh, Eden, the river flowing through Eden is a picture of the water of the Spirit of life. Jesus told us this very clearly. That's why in Revelation, Jesus' final words are, let all who are thirsty, let them come and drink freely from the river of the water of life. Why? Because Jesus has re-established the garden again. And he wants his people back in the garden so that they can receive eternal life, fullness, fruitfulness, all the things that these rivers represent. Each one of these names of these rivers has a meaning. Tigris means uh, rapidly. Euphrates means fruitfulness. Pishon means increase. And Gihon means bursting forth or gushing out. They're all positive things. You see, even in these nations, and three out of the four of these nations are not good, the river was still there. And whatever you are experiencing in life, the issue is, is the river there? Not whether the nation's good, not whether the people around you are good, not whether you're experiencing happy things in life. The issue is, are you at the river? Because God puts you in the garden so that you will always have life by the river. If you don't have water, you're dead. And so we've got these things. So the Tigris, or the Hiddekel there, that's in Assyria. Assyria is incredibly important in the Bible. The Assyrians were awful. They are probably the most evil people represented in the Old Testament. They were the terrorist nation of that day. Their, their, their warfare, the Assyrian warfare, actually constituted terrorism. They would literally impale people on spikes as an act of terror to make people so afraid that they would obey them. It's interesting that Assyria, the actual exact place, is where ISIS wants to re-establish what they call the Caliphate the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, which was Assyria. It's as if that ancient spirit's still there, that, terror, that, that, that awful manipulation through fear of getting people to obey. That's what Assyria was. Jonah went to Assyria to preach the good news of God. Went to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It's where Nimrod had one of his capitals way back in the beginning. Uh, and then there's, the, there's terrible kings from Assyria like uh, Shalmanasseh, people like that, who came and oppressed the Israelites, dragged them off the northern nation into captivity. But there was a river there. The Tigris, the Hiddekel. It was there. And the Euphrates, there was a huge city on the Euphrates. Does anyone know what that city was called? Babylon. Babylon was on the Euphrates River, ancient Babylonia, going way back, originally called the Chaldean nations in Mesopotamia, Sumerian, Akkadian cultures there. Ancient cradle of civilization keeps cropping up in the Bible over and over again. Not a nice place for the Jews. But there was a river there, the same river that flowed at the beginning. Then you've got the, uh, the Pishon, this river that flows through the land of Havilah, which we would today identify as Egypt. Egypt, if you're an Israelite, is not a nice place. But there was a river there. Egypt was obviously the place where all the Israelites lived at some time, the land of Havilah. If you just go to Genesis 25 and verse 18, I'll just you know, try and identify these things, show you I'm not just making this stuff up. Genesis chapter 25, verse 18. 
So this is talking about where the nations lived. His descendant, these were the Arab nations of, of Ishmael. His descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur. Shur was one side of Egypt, as in the eastern side. So Havilah is on the other side. So it shows that we're talking about this region we would call ancient Egypt. Havilah, near the eastern border of Egypt. As you go towards Ashur, that was obviously the, the route up there, back up to Assyria. They lived in hostility, uh, the Arab nations, to all the Jews. And they still do today. So this is what we're talking about, this, this place, this place of Egypt. And then the final one, the fourth one, if we go back to the picture, please. The fourth one is the Gihon. The Gusha, the one that bursts out, the one that bursts forth. Now, the Gihon is, this, is the different one, the Gihon's a strange one. Because there's only one river called the Gihon in the Bible, and it's not even a river. It's just a stream. And this is why some people think it must have meant another river that no longer exists. But biblically, there's only one Gihon. There's only one mentioned in the Bible. The Gihon Spring. Does anyone know where the Gihon Spring is? It flows from underneath Jerusalem. It's right in the middle of Israel, right there in the city of Jerusalem, the, the Gihon. This is the river that God talks about all the way through. It's in Jerusalem. So if you go to 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 30, 2 Chronicles 32 and verse 30, it was... Hezekiah, who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon spring and channeled the water to the west side of the city of David. He succeeded in everything he undertook. So King Hezekiah took this stream and channeled it through a tunnel into the city of Jerusalem. And many of us who've been to Israel have walked through that tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel. But it's the Gihon that flows through there. There is a river flowing under Jerusalem, but you can't see it. Because it's underground. There's a huge, what's called an aquifer. A massive amount of water underneath Jerusalem. S scientists reckon it's probably bigger than the Lake of Galilee. Massive. Flows under there. Now if you go back to the picture. The Gihon Spring flows in Jerusalem and then down in the valley there. Ultimately, Jerusalem slopes down into a valley um, where down towards where the Dead Sea is, where the River Jordan is, we call it the Jordan Valley. Now that valley that starts there is in the middle of a tectonic plate that is one of the main fissures, one of the main valleys, that um, one of the biggest valleys in the entire earth. It flows right down through the Red Sea, right down into Africa. It's exactly the same valley. It's thousands of miles long. When it gets to Africa, they call it the Great Rift Valley, where all the animals live in Africa. Some people think that's where that was part of the Garden of Eden as well. May have been. I'm not debating the geography. I'm looking at the spiritual principles. Now, it's changing. It's moving all the time, by the way. And it's interesting that according to the prophecies of Ezekiel and Zechariah, that valley is going to break wide open and a river is going to flow out of Jerusalem down into the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea is going to become fresh. Now, geographically, scientists say that is exactly what's going to happen at some point. Now, there's no way Ezekiel and Zechariah could have known that thousands of years ago. They just had a prophecy from God. But at some point, there's going to be a movement in that rift valley. Jerusalem's there's going to be an earthquake. The Mount of Olives is going to split in part because the fissure runs right through the Mount of Olives. And that river is going to break open and flow right down into that valley. And that river is going to become a mighty river again. That's exactly what Ezekiel prophesies is going to happen. Ezekiel 40, chapter 40 onwards. He sees a river coming out of Jerusalem. There's only one river there, that's the Gihon. It's only a little spring, but it's linked to this massive aquifer. So that river is still hidden, but if you go down under Jerusalem, you can see it. It actually flows into a pool called Shiloam. Jesus sent people there to this river, the Gihon. 
So we've got these four rivers there, okay? The Pishon, the Gihon, the Hidakel or Tigris, and the Euphrates. And these were the four rivers that were in Eden. They're the four rivers that God puts you by. Because God put Adam in Eden. And Jesus is still by the river at the end of time in Revelation. And he calls you to come to that river. So from the beginning of the Bible to the end, God is saying, you're at these rivers. So, so what do we do about these rivers? Well, they're all in the garden, but as we've already just mentioned, God's people at some point lived at the side of these rivers. Over thousands of years, the nation of Israel, at some point in their life cycle, God, God, put them by these rivers. Now you can think circumstances put them by these rivers. You might think bad things made them go by these rivers. Bad nations, captivity, things like that put them by these rivers. No, God put them there. To show us a very important principle. Because these were the rivers he made at the beginning in the garden of Eden. So let's go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. You see, eat not just Israel... But there's a, a very strange coincidence in the Bible, if you believe in coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences. There's no Hebrew word for coincidence. In the Bible, if it's a coincidence, God is trying to show you something. He's trying to show you a pattern to bring a prophetic revelation, a spiritual understanding. So, Abram, Terah took his son Abraham, Abram, his grandson, Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarah, the wife of his son, Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Right. If you were looking at that picture, that map we saw, where is Ur of the Chaldees? Could you put the picture back up, please? Where is Ur of the Chaldees? Where did Abraham live for 80 years of his life or so? Ur of the Chaldees is right down there at, between the Euphrates and the Tigris, where the rivers meet. Mesopotamia. Mes Mesopotamia just means the land between the rivers. Mesopotami. It means the place between the rivers. Abraham lived between the Euphrates and the Tigris. So he knew what these rivers were. That's where he lived. Ur of the Chaldees, which became later Babylon, where the Tower of Babel was built, and the Euphrates, where Babylon was built. So Abraham lived there in Mesopotamia, Acts chapter 7 and verse 2. So he learned who God was even before he moved to a different river. Because God spoke to him while he was still there beside the Euphrates and the Tigris. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. Before he lived in Haran. Before he moved, Abraham knew God. Heard God's voice. He was by the rivers. The rivers of Eden. Two of them. But God would take Abraham... To all four rivers. That's not a coincidence that the father of the Jewish nation, the father of the Hebrews, had to experience life by the side of all four rivers. Because he had to experience life as it really is. He had to experience life here in Babylon, Chaldea. Mesopotamia. Now he heard God. He understood God. God spoke to him there. If you're here this morning, you might have heard God. You might have heard God's voice. You might have received a word from God. You might know what it is by that river. However, what did God say? I'm taking you to another river. No, I like this river. It doesn't matter whether you like that river. The river of God is much bigger than what you've experienced. And he needs to take you to a different aspect of life. And you can kick and scream if you want, but he's taking you. 
Abraham was going. His dad was taking him, by the way, Terah. Have you noticed that life never turns out the way you thought it was going to? Anyone disagree with that? Because you've got a big shot coming. Because it doesn't. Because God will make you experience his life in different circumstances. So although Abraham heard God up there by these rivers, God says, I'm taking you to another river. I'm, I'm going to give you my promise. I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to make you experience me in a different aspect of life. So he's taking him from Babylon, where? To the promised land. Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that what all his children would experience? Would all the children of Israel have to experience living in Babylon and then having to leave Babylon and go to the promised land? Isn't that exactly what would happen to the Jewish nation? You see, God always follows a certain specific spiritual pattern. So when you say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me, I'm different, guess what? You've got a shot coming. It does apply to you, and you're not any different. God will take you through the same experiences so that you can learn to live wherever God puts you because it's the river that gives life, not the nation you live in, not the life circumstances, not whether your life's good, bad, happy, sad. You learn to live by the river that flows. Jesus said the river is the Holy Spirit. So not only did Abraham experience this, the children of Israel would experience this. But guess what? The children of Israel didn't want to go to Babylon. Babylon's a picture of the confusion of the world. They did all kinds of weird, crazy things in Babylon. Have you noticed this world's getting weirder and crazier? You know, I read, the other, I read yesterday there were some Christians being investigated by the police because they said men were different than women. They, they literally said, I, I, I don't want to appear offensive here, they literally said, men have got penises, women haven't. And they were reported as committing a hate crime. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, that's biology. That's just scientific fact. That's not a hate crime. But we live in a crazy, mixed-up world where right is wrong and wrong is right, and everything is gone bonkers, just as Jesus said it would. Jesus says at the end, society will be like Sodom and Gomorrah, where they're going to threaten to kill Lot for not allowing people in his house to be raped. Because in their culture of the day, rape was okay. And we're heading down the same path. We're almost there in many instances. They didn't want to go to Babylon. Look at Psalm 137, by, uh, verse 1. Famous psalm made famous by a group called Boney M. By the rivers of Babylon. No, don't sing it. <laughs> by the rivers of Babylon, not in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon. Why did they say that? Because they knew they were by a river. Who took them to Babylon? It's a trick question. God. Who said God? Well done. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar and took, came and took them to Babylon, for 30 years, Jeremiah had been prophesying to them, you are going to Babylon. You are going to live there. You will settle down there. You will build houses there. Jeremiah chapter 29 gives that famous prophecy. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But that was only dependent on if they went to that river. They couldn't disobey God and then claim that promise. I don't want to live in the world. I want to live in a monastery. Well, you can't. You've got to live in the world. But in that confusion of this world, there is a river flowing. And if you don't know the rivers there, guess what? You're going to die in the world. Because it will kill you with its confusion. It will drive you mad. It is so crazy. It makes no sense. Stop trying to make sense of some of the policies and the political views. They don't make sense. They are totally contrary to anything that is righteous. 
You can petition, you can do whatever you want. This world makes no sense. Babylon made no sense. Right there back in the book of Genesis, Babylon was a picture of confusion. We even use that word today as confusion. Someone is babbling. They're talking nonsense. But they would have to go there. What did they do? By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered where we used to be. Do you know they did that for 70 years? For 70 years, they moaned that this wasn't as good as it used to be. Have you met anyone like that? If you were in this church, you've met loads of people like that. In fact, there's a good percentage of people like that here this morning. God bless you, we love you, but if you want to moan for 70 years that it's not as good as it used to be, carry on. But God's going to make you learn His life where you are. No, I want to go back. You're not going back. Not yet, anyway. Not till you've learned the principle of the dream. On the poplar, we sung our hearts. Well, I'll stay, but I'm not going to sing. Now, th there's a good 60% people here like that this morning. Well, I'll come, but if you think I'm singing them songs... I'm not singing them modern songs. Anyway, we had no drums this morning, so I'm definitely not singing. Not as good as it used to be, you know, when we had an organ. When we had an organ, it was good. And we only sung proper hymns instead of this modern rubbish. 70 years. And they were still moaning. It's like the children in the desert. 40 years, still moaning. Not as good as it used to be. God doesn't change. God is God. The river is the river. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. There are captors asked us for songs. The tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs. It's like the pastor, isn't it, on Sunday morning when he's trying to get you to sing. Come on, sing a song of joy. Jesus loves you. God's with you. I'm not. I'm not. It's rubbish. Life's awful. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while we are in a foreign land? What are they doing? Oh, unless you are going to give me what I used to have, I'm not singing. Unless you bring back the organ, I'm not singing. Unless we have bagpipes, I'm not singing. No one's ever said that. No one's ever said that. The words weren't in the right order. I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to live by the life God gives me, not by the circumstances around me. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. Well, it's good to remember Jerusalem, but at the end of the day, you have to live the life that God has given you where you are. The river that is flowing where you are. The rivers of Babylon, Tigris, Euphrates, were in Eden. God put Adam in Eden. The world around them was confusing, but the life of God was still clear. The river of the water of life flowed through Babylon. God was still there. God protected them. God raised up leaders for them, people like Daniel and Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And God would bring them back to all the promises he'd had, but only when they learned by faith to live in what God has given them, not the circumstances around them. And so they spent 70 years waiting there. It's, it's amazing. Have you noticed God's not in a rush? Does that annoy you? It does, doesn't it? Yolanda, how annoying is it? We were praying for your sons to come back for a year now. Now they're back. Why did we have to wait a year? I don't know. You, you take it up with the Lord. I'm not doing it. I mean, you, you do it. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just praising God they're here. 70, why have we got to wait 70 years in Babylon? Can't we have a couple of weeks? Can't we just, you know, all right, Lord, we've learned that. No, you've got to learn the life of God where he puts you. Some of you are only in this church because the church where you have, you, you couldn't stay there, so you had to come here, and you're hoping you can go back. I know I am. <laughs> you, but you've got to live where God puts you. If you try and go back before, the, or if you try and go back at all, it depends what God's doing. You try and step out of that obedience, you, you know, you're in trouble. 
They didn't obey Jeremiah. They tried to go somewhere else. They all died. You can't disobey. You've got to go. The river of Babylon, Euphrates, means fruitfulness. What did Jeremiah tell them? If you go to Babylon, if you will increase. Have sons and daughters. Build houses and gardens there. Settle down. Seek the peace and prosperity of the place that I have called you. When the, when the fullness of time comes, I will take you to where you need to be. Now, after 70 years, when you're probably 20 years old when you receive that promise, you're, the place you're going is heaven. Sorry. You're going to be 90. You aren't going to want to go back and live in a tent. The ultimate place God's taking to is, is heaven, not anywhere here on earth. So let's get that. We will be fruitful if we are by the river, even in Babylon. Okay, put up the chart, the picture. Okay, next important river. They not only lived up there in Babylon. Did Abraham, did the Jews ever go and live in Egypt? Yes. The Pishon. The Nile, as we, we would call it today. Have you noticed, everyone in the Bible, God made them live in Egypt for a while. Even Jesus. Yeah? Jesus, born in Bethlehem, the Messiah, God still took him to the river of Egypt, the land of Havilah, where the Nile was. So if Jesus had to do this, you're not getting out of it. Abraham went and lived in Egypt. We know Jesus did. The prophet said, out of Egypt I have called my son to come to where God has called them to. But they had to learn this by living in Egypt. Go to Genesis 12, verse 7. Genesis 12 and verse 7. So Abraham leaves Ur of the Chaldees, Mesopotamia, and travels to the promised land where the Gihon is. He's going to where God has called him. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. He's in the place he's always dreamed of. He's got the promise of God. Everything's going great. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went towards the hills east of Bethel. He came to Bethel like a good Christian. He pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord. He's worshipping God. Everything's great. He's receiving the promises of God. You ever been there? Abraham set out, continues towards the Negev, mm, sort of getting a bit deserty now. You know, all the excitement of the new things God's done starting to wear off now. Now there was famine in the land, Abraham went down to Egypt to live there. Hold on a minute, what's happened? What's he doing in Egypt? Well, circumstances have now moved him. He's not now in Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees, he's up there. He's not now there by the Assyrian Tigris River. He'd come to where God has, he thought everything was now right, and then he ends up going to Egypt. Because circumstances dictated that he had to go there. There was no food. So he went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was so severe in Egypt. So there he is. And he enters Egypt there and stuff happens in Egypt. So he goes and lives in Egypt. Now Babylon... Is a picture of the world and its confusion. Egypt is also a picture of the world all the, t all the way through the Bible. I'm sure you know that. That's why God saved the Israelites out of Egypt, out of the world into his promise. It's a picture of salvation from death to life. But Egypt is a, is a different picture of the world. It's a picture of the slavery of the world. But it's also a picture of the luxuries of this world. Did you know that luxuries can enslave you? I mean, it's proverbial even today, all the gold of Egypt. You know, where did the river of Havilah, the Pishon, flow to where the gold was? There is gold in that land. Why did Abraham go down to Egypt? Because there was prosperity in Egypt. Have you noticed God didn't tell Abraham to go to Egypt. God told him to go to the promised land. Abraham, through circumstances, just went. Why? Well, there's nothing wrong, is there? There's nothing wrong in being prosperous. There's nothing wrong in having gold. There's nothing wrong in seeking the good things of this world, is there? 
Yeah, but what does the Bible tell us? Seeking wealth is a trap. It's a snare. We live in a Christian world where the prosperity gospel is preached as though that's what God's will is for you. God wants you to be rich, wealthy, healthy, and prosperous. Well, that might happen, but you've got to be very careful with that because that becomes a trap. And Paul warned Timothy and people against that to people who claim that gain is godliness. Jesus says, the wealth and the deceitfulness of riches choke and make you unfruitful. And he said that four times in the parable of the the seeds. You see, Abraham made the mistake of thinking he could just obey what appeared to give him prosperity, wealth, luxury, and prosperity. Now, he did get those things. That's the strange thing. When he left Egypt, it says he increased in all of these goods. Do you know what the Pishon means? I've already told you. Someone say it. Increase. You see, God does want to increase you. God, God does want to prosper you. But he doesn't want that to be your motives. God does want you to be healthy. Of course God wants these things for you. But that should not be what your heart is seeking. You should be seeking what God has called us to in obedience to him. So look what happens. Okay, j- jump to verse 14. So when he goes there, what happens? When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. Watch this. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep, cattle, male, female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. Abraham did increase in every way. He increased in numbers, he increased in people, he increased in goods, he became prosperous and fruitful, and he increased. At what cost? His wife was taken into slavery. Is it worth it? Some of the men are nodding at me. (laughs) Ferrari wife. (laughs) Hmm. I'm going to have to pray about that one. You never know, God might want me to have a Ferrari. <laughs> Wife's always wanted to go to Egypt. <laughs> you see, we don't understand devil, the devil's trap. What was, how, did, how did the devil try and tempt Jesus? I will give you all the wealth of the world. Just belong to me. Just become my slave and I'll give you everything. What did Jesus say? Away from me, Satan. I worship the Lord God, I serve him and obey him only. You are giving me nothing. Rich, but a slave. The river Pishon flows through Havilah. Gems, pearls, gold, riches are there. Yeah, but you will become a slave to that. You will spend your life trying to acquire it. And it didn't just happen to Abraham. It happened to his children. We don't need to look at the, the passages. We know very well that the children of Israel went down to Egypt. They were only supposed to stay there for a short while, and then God was going to call them to where he wanted them. But what did they do? They stayed there for over 400 years. And they went down to start with and became very prosperous. They were given the best of the land, and by the end, what was their condition? They were slaves to a world system. And that's what happens to people in church. That's what happened to churches. They become slaves to a political system rather than living freely by the river where God wants them to be. And so they're doing things because they have to, because their political environment makes them do it, because they're not actually free children of God anymore. They're slaves to a system that they have to obey. But that's not what God's plan is. God's plan was always to bring them out of Egypt. And so he sent Moses to them and he brings them out of Egypt. One of the greatest stories in the whole Bible, the Exodus, where the children of Israel, what? They are brought 
out of Egypt. They are now moving from the Pishon, where they've increased, where are they going? To the promised land, to the Gihon. Abraham went to the Gihon. It's where he met Melchizedek. And so he had to come out of Egypt. He came out of Egypt. He had increased. He had prospered. But he'd learnt the lesson that it wasn't worth being a slave. It wasn't worth his bride being a slave. The bride is the church, the bride of Christ. God does not want to prosper you if that means you end up a slave. He doesn't want you to be a slave. And this world will make you a slave to its system. God wants to take us out. So after 400 years, he freed the slaves. He sent Moses to them. He was now moving them from the Pishon, from that river that they'd experienced, where they'd experienced increase, but they recognize now that it was God who brings the increase. And he was moving them. Did they want to go? Well, to start with, they did, didn't they? Till they realized what it meant. Look at Genesis uh, 45 and verse 17, just to get the context. Genesis 45, verse 17. Pharaoh had said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals, return to the land of uh, Canaan. Bring your father and families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. You can enjoy the fat of the land. You see, everything appeared good in Egypt till they realized they were slaves. Till they realized they had no choice anymore. Till things had changed. So Moses came to take them back. Numbers 11 verse 4. Numbers 11 verse 4. So God delivers them through the Red Sea. Takes them from the Pishon. He's taking them to the next river. The next river that was in the Garden of Eden. They were so happy about it. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks and onions and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. What were they moaning about? They were moaning about life by the side of the river in Egypt. Because that's where the fish came from, obviously. That's, they planted the vegetables there by the side of the river Nile because the water would flood the fields. They weren't happy that they were free. They would rather have had slavery and the lifestyle they were used to. And they wanted to go back to Egypt. And the story of the Exodus is a story of God's people moaning, grumbling, complaining that they wanted something better than what God had given them. So even when he was giving them the manna, the bread of heaven, they moaned that it wasn't as good as the world. Nothing changes. Christians follow the same pattern as the people in the Bible did look at verse 18 of the same chapter tell the people consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat the Lord heard you when you wailed if only we had meat to eat we were better off in Egypt really they were really better off being slaves to the world than being free children of God yeah, but they were richer in Egypt. They could do what they could eat the food they wanted in Egypt. They lost sight of their freedom. They just remembered where they had been, not to the new river God was taking them to. They're not better off. Do you know that never changed? That morning never changed. A thousand years later, even in the time of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was prophesying to them where God was moving them, do you know what they did? They picked Jeremiah up, they grabbed the people, and they went back to Egypt. That was a thousand years after they'd left, they went back to the place God had freed them from. You can't fathom that. You can't think anyone would be so dumb as to do that. They all died in Egypt, by the way, those that did that. You would think, you know, that's, that's never going to happen. But if you've been a Christian a long time, you'll realize you will see so many people God touches their lives. They experience the goodness of God. They get involved in church. They start serving God. And then one day they decide they're going to go back to their old lifestyle. And they reject God. They reject the church. And they end up living twice as bad as they used to. And if you've been a Christian a long time, that's not a, 
isolated incident. That happens all the time. How would someone do that? Why would someone do that? Why would someone crucify Jesus all again? Because they loved it in Egypt. There's one river we, we, we miss there before we come on to the Gihon. The Hiddekel, the Tigris. Remember, that was in the land of Ashur. That was uh, in Assyria. 2 Kings 17, verse 22. 2 Kings 17 and verse 22. The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam. They didn't turn away from them. That The sins of Jeroboam were worshipping other gods as well as God. They worshipped God, but they also served their own idols. God won't allow you to do that. Until the Lord removed them from his presence, as he had warned them through his servants, the prophets. This is a thousand years after they'd been in Egypt. So the people of Israel were taken from the homeland into exile in Assyria. And they are still there. Remember, Assyria and Babylon are different. They're different nations, they're different empires. Babylon was by the Euphrates. Ashur was by the Tigris, further up north. Different river. You see, when they were backslidden, when they started worshipping false gods, when they started doing what they want and started disobeying God, they fell away and God says, I'm taking you into captivity. Not Babylon, Assyria. If you think Babylon's bad, Assyria's a lot worse. As we've already said, the Assyrians were the terrorists of the day. They were, they were absolute fanatics. The Assyrians wouldn't compromise with anybody. Most of the Israelites were, were, were impaled on stakes. The entire city is destroyed. And they never came home. See, later when the Babylonians took them captive by the rivers of Babylon, they did come back home. But those that were taken to Assyria, the northern kingdom, they never came back. People today still argue about where these lost tribes are. I think it's a fruitless exercise, to be honest, because they're still there. You see, the Assyrians represent fear and terror. They, they, they represent this system of manipulation and control. And as a Christian, you're freed from that. But it's amazing how many Christians are still afraid of so many things. It's as if they're terrorized by world events. It's as if they're, they, they're so apprehensive and afraid about everything that's happening around them. They don't know what to do. It's the spirit of Assyria. Even in Assyria, there was the river there. The Hiddekel. The Tigris, that which rapidly flows, that river of life, it's still there, even amongst this terror. Sometimes I don't turn on the news, because I know it will ruin my day. The latest report of Christians being massacred all over the world. That's usually not even on the British news. There were thousands of Christians massacred in Nigeria last week, didn't even make the news. More concerned about someone not baking a cake for somebody. Because the news is warped. It terrorizes. Look at Isaiah 37 verse 10. When the Assyrians were coming, the whole nation was terrified. They were more terrified when the Assyrians were coming than when the Babylonians were coming. And God had told them the Assyrians weren't going to capture them. They were terrified. That word, Assyria, Sennacherib the king, Shalmanasseh, evil, wicked kings who intended to kill them all. Set up their own state, religious system. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now this is the king of Assyria through his generals threatening God's people. Saying, you've no chance. We're going to get you. We're going to destroy the church. We're going to stop you meeting. We're going to pull down your religious system. Say to the king of Hezekiah of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you. Don't believe God. God can't save you. Your God can't save you. Our God's going to destroy your God. Don't let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. You see, God said to the faithful remnant in Jerusalem, I'm not going to hand you over to these terrorists. And what did the terrorists say? No, that's not true. Your God can't save you from that. We're going to get you. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And do you think you will be delivered? Go to the next verse. Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? The gods, and then he lists all the areas. Have you noticed there he lists the people of Eden? 
You see, the king of Syria is boasting, I'm better than your God, our God's better than your God, even the people of Eden can't be saved out of our hands, we're going to destroy all of you, we're going to kill you all, we're going to take you all captive. And they had taken the disobedient nation captive to Assyria, the northern kingdom, they had done that. So you can imagine the people in Jerusalem were terrified. Look at the bad stuff they're doing all over. They're killing people. They're going to come and kill us. Yeah, but God had said they're not. So who did they believe? Who did they believe? Did they give in to the terrorism? Look at verse 33 of the same chapter. What did he respond when you see all this around you? God came to Hezekiah and to Isaiah and this is what God says. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. God said he's not going to get into this city. Which city? Jerusalem. Who's God talking to? Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and verse 30. We'll pull this to a close now. Second Chronicles 32 and verse 30. It was Hezekiah before this had happened who blocked the upper outlet of the Gihon and channeled the water into the city of David. Why did God tell Hezekiah not to be afraid? Because Hezekiah had made sure the river of God was flowing into his city. He even dug a tunnel to make sure the river flowed into his house. Hezekiah's tunnel. But no one could see that river because it was underground. The Gihon. Yeah, but it's the Gihon that's in Jerusalem, not Babylon. Not Assyria, not Havilah, Egypt. No, it's the Gihon that flows into Jerusalem. And it's the Gihon that is the river that flows out from the temple in Ezekiel's prophecy. It's the Gihon that Jesus talked about as the living water that flows from where? From within the river that you can't see. And that's why when Jesus said that in John's Gospel at the Feast of Tabernacles, you know at the Feast of Tabernacles, the high priest would go down to the Gihon, go down to the Pool of Siloam, and he would get the Chaim Mayim, the living water. They would walk up to the temple, and the priest, at the greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles, would pour out the water and would say, living water, and everyone would rejoice. And when you read the Gospel, that's when Jesus shouted out in the middle of the meeting, whoever is thirsty... Let him come to me, and out of his innermost being will flow a river of living water. By this he meant the Holy Spirit. Jesus says it will flow out from within you. Why was Hezekiah told not to be afraid of the Assyrians? Because there is a river hidden that's flowing from within you. He will not get into Jerusalem. Why? Because the Gihon is there. The river of the water of life. My river is flowing from within. Psalm 46 and verse 5. One of the most famous psalms. Psalm 46. Verse 4. Verse 4. There is a river... Whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, within her, 
She will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. There is a river in the city of God. The city of God is Jerusalem. There is no river in the city of Jerusalem. Yes, there is, the Gihon. But it's underground. It's within her. Where is the river in you? It's within you. It's hidden. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. The river in the center of the world, the river at the center of time, the river at the center of Israel in Jerusalem is the river that was there right in Eden. And it's in you. The Holy Spirit is within you. That's why when they went down at Tabernacles and took this river, that's why Jesus had to cry out. It's not the literal river. They are the symbols of the Holy Spirit back in Eden at the end of time in Revelation. It's the Holy Spirit within you. Doesn't matter if you're in Babylon, Egypt, or Syria. Doesn't matter if you're scared, afraid, or prosperous. The important thing is that the river of life is flowing within you. That's what's important. The Gihon, it means to burst out. That's what Jesus said. If you believe in me, the Holy Spirit will burst out from within your innermost being. If you're in the garden and if you have the river. Abraham went there and met Melchizedek. Do you know it's at the, it's at the Gihon where the kings of Israel, the kings of Jerusalem were anointed and crowned. They took them down to the Gihon, it tells us in the Bible. And there they were anointed. That's where Solomon was anointed. Because it's the anointing that comes upon you when the Holy Spirit flows through you. The river of God. That's where it all is. The prophets, the priests and the kings anointed at the Gihon. Because it's the Gihon that is in the middle of the garden. It always was. Jesus tells us to come and drink. When Jesus did in Jerusalem, his greatest miracle actually. Now he raised people from the dead in other places. At Bethany and at Nain and he, in Capernaum he raised people from the dead. But in Jerusalem, do you know, the greatest miracle that got the greatest attention. That got all the Sadducees and all the leaders and all everyone up in arms. Jesus did one miracle that the whole city investigated and carried out uh, an interrogation on the man. It was the healing of the man who was blind. Have you noticed how Jesus healed him? He didn't touch his eyes and say, be healed. He says, go down to the pool of Shiloam, where the Gihon is. Go down to the Gihon. Siloam is just where the Gihon flowed into the pool. It's like a reservoir of the Gihon. He sent him to the river. He didn't just heal him. He said, go down and wash in the Gihon at Siloam. And then his eyes were opened. Isn't it interesting that Jesus sent the man back to the place of the original garden so his eyes could be opened? Why did he do that? Because that's where the problem of his blindness started in the first place. What happened to Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God in the garden? Their eyes were opened, but opened in a wrong way. You remember what the disciples says, did this man sin or his parents because he was born blind? Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents. In other words, he's not blaming the man because of what Adam and Eve did. God doesn't blame you for what your parents did or even what Adam did. But you will be blamed if you disobey him and reject what he says. Then you'll stay blind. Jesus told the Pharisees that. He says, go down to the river and your eyes will be opened. And because he obeyed, his eyes were opened. And if you'll allow the river of God to flow, burst forth, Gihon, that's what it means. The Holy Spirit to burst forth from within you, you also will see. Not like Adam and Eve, but you'll see spiritually. And you'll see spiritual truth. How's that happened to you? Is the river flowing? Have you experienced Babylon and Assyria and Egypt? Yes, you will. But there's always a river there. The Pishon, the Gihon, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the river of God in the garden. God never takes it away. 
It's always there. You can drink freely from the water of the river of life right now. 